Welcome. In today's episode, I wanted to show you a little piece of history where computers and music sort of overlap. Now, anybody who used computers back in the 1980s and 1990s should be familiar with something called an ad lib card or a sound blaster card. These were the most common sound cards used at PCs. Whenever you went to install a game, you would have to actually select what type of sound card you were using. The AdLib card came out first in 1987, but at its core was really the Yamaha YM3812 FM synthesis chip. Now, the Sound Blaster came out next in 1989, which also featured the same Yamaha 3812 chip. Pretty much every subsequent sound card either included this chip or internally emulated this chip for backwards compatibility. In fact, it is possible the computer you're using right now still emulates that chip either deep down in software or hardware, uh, just like uh, modern video cards still emulate uh, old CGA and EGA graphics modes from the 1980s just for backwards compatibility. This chip had nine voices and they could be programmed independently to create whatever kind of sound you wanted. This old Casio keyboard from 1984 only has a single voice. We call that monophonic. No matter what I do, I can't play more than one note at a time. So the AdLib card would play nine voices at the same time, and you could modify things like waveform, modulation, attack, decay for individual voices. It also had an interesting mode called percussion mode, where you could sacrifice three of your voices and gain five unique drum sounds. All right, so here's something you might not know. This keyboard here, um, came out around 1986, and it's just a kid's keyboard, and you would have probably seen this keyboard on the shelf of places like Toys R Us, Target, Kmart, Walmart, etc. But what's really interesting is what's inside. Notice that it's built around the same YM3812 chip that was used in the AdLib and Sound Blaster cards. So imagine for a moment if you could take a Sound Blaster card and somehow attach a keyboard to it and some speakers so that you could play it like an instrument. And that's pretty much exactly what this is. It's a sound blaster with keys. And what's really cool about it is it's got these little sliders here, which allow you to adjust the uh, spectrum, waveform, modulation, attack decay, stuff like that manually so you can directly control the chip and create whatever kind of sound that you want. And here's a little sample for you. It's, um, it's an old tune from an MS-DOS game, uh, Ultima 6. Now, watch me recreate the same sound right here on this keyboard. Okay, I think I've matched the sound. Let's add a little sustain to it and see what we have. I also want to show you that it definitely has nine voices. It's actually kind of hard to do, but I'll hold down nine keys and you'll be able to see that it will not play anything else. Also, if you put it into percussion mode, you have these five unique percussion sounds here on the last five keys. They don't sound all that great, but they are what they are. But notice that while this mode is enabled, I now only have six voices for playing melody. This shouldn't be any surprise since this is identical behavior to the AdLib and Sound Blaster cards. So Yamaha produced hundreds of different keyboards, and I've spent the last month or so um, digging through information and trying to figure out exactly which ones used the YM3812 synthesis chip. Now, um, I have found at least eight models that were all produced between 1986 and 1990 that use this chip. And uh, I've put the information down in the description field below this video so that you can look and see which models they are, in case you're interested in obtaining one of these for yourself. Now, a lot of these keyboards are really similar to each other. I narrowed it down to three different families of keyboards, and I bought one of each family from eBay so I could show you. The first one you've already seen, and it's the PSS 470, which was made in 1987. These are actually still holding their value on eBay. I had to pay $60 for this, plus another $20 for shipping. Okay, so what makes this particular model so collectible currently is not because everybody knows it has the AdLib Sound Blaster chip in it, but actually because it's got the little manual controls for the synthesizer on it, which are uh, actually kind of hard to find. Um, this keyboard's also very popular with the circuit bending crowd. Now, because it's got such small keys, um, it's taken me a little bit of time to get used to playing it because I'm used to playing uh, keyboards with larger keys, but uh, I've gotten used to it and I can actually play, play some pretty interesting things on it. Still, it does have a line level output, but no professional features like a sustain pedal, MIDI interface, or velocity detection. Well, now as far as the actual sounds go, well, it sounds like a sound blaster. 
So the next step up was the Yamaha PSR-12, also made in 1987. I only paid $19 for this on eBay, plus $20 shipping. This has the same number of keys as the previous one, but they're full-sized keys and thus much more natural for somebody like me to play. Now, back in the day, this keyboard would have probably sold for a little bit more money than the last one. It still has 49 keys on it, but it's still not really a professional keyboard because it lacks a sustain pedal or MIDI interface or, you know, velocity on the keys or anything like that. But believe it or not, I still only paid $20 for this on eBay plus another $20 for shipping. Now, it does not have the synthesizer controls like the previous one I showed you, but it does have like you know, around 32 uh, built-in preset sounds that you can use, and they all sound pretty similar to all the other uh, keyboards in this family. There isn't any point in comparing the sound quality since inside it has the exact same Yamaha 3812 synthesizer chip. Um, for example, here's uh, some piano music with it. But it does have some really nice bell sounds. And the last family of keyboards I'm going to show is the PSR32, also from 1987. Now this one is big. This thing is more along the lines of a professional keyboard. It has 61 keys, which I consider to be professional size. And believe it or not, I still only paid $20 for this monster on eBay, plus another $20 for shipping. In fact, I think they may have lost money on the shipping because this thing's kind of heavy. Again, it has the exact same synthesizer chip and the exact same sound as the other two keyboards I've showed you, but this one is a little bit more professional, and I could actually see this perhaps being played on stage. It still lacks the ability to have a sustain pedal or a velocity detection on the keys or any kind of MIDI interface, but <laughs> who knows, maybe Van Halen used something like this. The keyboard does have one standout difference from the other two though. Notice that it says PCM Rhythm on it. It actually has a separate sound chip for the percussion sounds. Notice it has a lot more drum sounds available. PCM basically means they're digital samples of real drums, so they sound a little bit more realistic than the AdLib and Sound Blaster drum. And since the drum sounds come from a different chip, that means you can have all nine melody voices even when you have the drums playing. And I'll take a brief moment to also mention the Yamaha YM2413 chip. It's basically the same chip as the YM3812, but it's cost reduced. Remember how I said the nine voices could be independently programmed? Well, in this 2413, they designed it so that you can only program one sound, and all nine voices have to play the same sound. Now there are several very low cost keyboards that were made in the early 1990s uh, that use this chip, and some of them can be obtained on eBay for as little as $10. Now they may not have the exact same chip as the Sound Blaster, but they do still have the same characteristic sound if that's what you're looking for. Okay, and I have two more things to tell you. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that some of this information you've seen is going to be recycled in another upcoming video, and I've actually been working on this upcoming video for quite a while, and it's uh, on the history of computer sound and music. And uh, so I'm going to be showing some of the same stuff, but I wanted an opportunity to show you these three keyboards up close and give you a little bit more detail about them because I think these are actually going to be collectible in the future and some of them already are now. Okay, and the second thing I wanted to tell you is that I'm starting up yet another channel. Now I know I already have some other channels, but this has really been the only channel I've been active on for at least the last couple of years. And um, this new channel is going to be focusing on music. And uh, one of the things we're going to be doing is, uh, me and some of my friends, we're going to be taking these older, obsolete keyboards, and especially like kids' keyboards and stuff, and uh, we're going to be uh, putting, you know, using several of them together uh, to create some really uh, neat sounding music. And uh, if you think about it, it actually kind of is along the same lines as this channel because one of the things I do in this channel is you'll see me often take an obsolete piece of equipment, whether it's a, you know, an iPhone, iPad, or, or an old iBook, and you know, I'll, rather than focusing on what it can't do, because everybody knows what they can't do, um, I'll focus on what you can do with it. And, you know, what's our, what are its strengths? And so that's kind of what we're going to do with the music. We're going to show these older keyboards and say, well, we, we know what they can't do, but what cool things can you do with them? And I think people are going to be really surprised. And of course, I'll put a link down in the description field, a uh, link to that new channel if you're interested in that sort of thing. 